another episode of the Dawson Grant Academy Talk Show. My name is Dawson Grant, a three-time Olympian, former board director of London 2012 Big Team. Each week, me and my guests explore the mindset, determination, and focus it takes to become an elite. Gain the insight to the world of sports, film, and more. Today's show is sponsored by Rhythm Kitchen, Caribbean food fresh off the grill. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Raw Academy Talk Show. And have I got a treat for you today? I have a World Cup member in 2003 going out to the rugby union, yes, the young rugby union fans, and no other than the legend Kieran Bracken. Welcome to the show. How you doing? How you doing, Dalton? That's a really nice introduction. Um, so yeah, you, you should be my agent. My agent never says anything like that. Most people start off with uh, Kieran Bracken, winner of Dancing and Ice, instead of the rugby rugby World Cup, which most people know me for. But we're going to go into that. Well, well, let's go straight into it then, Kieran, because obviously, um, what was your aspirations as a, as a youth, you know, growing up? Well, when I was younger, um, I was sort of sport billy. I played pretty much every sport and um, I was one of the lucky ones, a bit like yourself with probably, you know, good DNA, I, whatever I sort of put my hand to, I was quite good at, apart from high jump because I was quite small. Um, but generally speaking, I was good at most sports and I played football to a quite high standard in Liverpool, but uh, rugby was probably you know, the most suited to my to my body and my size and my power and played a bit of rugby league, but then played mostly rugby union. Um, but you have to imagine, though, that rugby uh, wasn't uh, a professional sport at the time. There was, you know, there wasn't an opportunity to make a living, you know, in rugby. Obviously, my, you know, my uh, hopes and aspirations were to, to go on and play for England, uh, a very distant dream when I was a young kid, but uh, there wasn't a career in it. So it wasn't, you know, no one knew anything about gyms and strength and power like they do now. So it was a very different era I grew up in. Nowadays, my kids growing up, you know, aspirations play at high level, but they're in the gym and, the, you know, it's very, very different. But uh, I wouldn't swap it for the world. Obviously, um, growing up, and what was it? Your foundation was it your family? Obviously, what was what did you have a sporty family? Yeah, well, my my mum played hockey for Ireland, and so I'm guessing I got most of my attributes from her. Um, you know, my parents were, were always you know always driving around and dropped me off everywhere here, there, and everywhere, and you know, encouraging us as kids. There was four of us to you know, just to, to do what we can in sports and enjoy ourselves. It was an opportunity to get out of the house and just do different things and. Yeah, there was obviously always a lot of support from the family, um, you know, driving me here, then every, everywhere. Whenever I was playing for county or, you know, England schools or travelling, they were always, always there, you know, to go out of their way to make it happen for me. So that was certainly, you know, one of the, the I think, the leg-ups that I had to, to, to playing at a high level. Well, great. So you played league a little bit. Obviously, you, 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 your career took off in the rugby union. So what is the difference to many people who don't know rugby to that extent? Obviously, rugby union would know league. Break down the difference because you play both. And give us the insight to the mindset to both as well, or if it's the same mindset. Well, I think if you want to play elite rugby anyway, um, you know, at any level, I, I think, you know, the, the two sports are quite different, rugby league, rugby union. Um but I, I ended up uh, going to boarding school and they only played rugby union. So I stopped playing rugby league. So it was more circumstances that changed for me. If I'd have stayed in, in Liverpool where I was growing up, I probably would have focused a bit more on rugby league. So it was really circumstances that pushed me into playing, uh, you know, rugby union, I played for school and then, I ended up, you know, playing for England schools a year young and then played uh, and then captain England schools. Um, but but like I say, you know, it was it was it was like a pastime. Um, it wasn't um, it wasn't like a how can I say it? like a career path where training every day to, you know, to become a better rugby player. It was I played for school and, you know, and that was it, you know, and ended up getting selected. And but the game was amateur. So it was very different to, to what it is now. But the mindset. I guess at the time, 
for me was always about, you know, being the best that I could be. Um, I would be out in the training park doing a little bit of extra training all the time. And those sort of traits and though that attitude definitely helped me in sort of later years when the game did go professional, when I was trying to play for England, even though it was in the amateur era, I had a, I, I could only describe like a professional, a professional desire to be, to be the best. So what I loved about that, you said in, in Liverpool, where you obviously education is, is a key factor, your well, foundation of your life, I would say, and you've gone on. How did you juggle education and sport, especially at a high level? Because you did say you played for England as schoolboys. So how did you, you handle that? Yeah, yeah, it was it was a bit of a struggle, and partly because. Um, you know, I remember, you know, taking my uh, A-levels at the same time as captain in England and we were driving up and down the country playing in the what was then the Four Nations. Um, and it was very, very hard to juggle everything, really. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was... And actually, you know, as years went by, I ended up, I went to law school. Um, I did a law degree as well. And I remember playing for England students and traveling, playing on tournaments and, you know, England under 21s as well. Um, and I was always trying to fit in my, my degree at the same time. So I found it really hard to juggle the uh, academics with, with the rugby. But like I say, the rugby, um, you know, we weren't in the gym then. You know, I didn't go into a gym until I was sort of 25. Um, so it was it was just training in the week and playing at weekends and sometimes in the midweek. It was that. So for me, uh, you know, the juggle was a lot lot easier than it would be nowadays, uh, a lot easier. But I do remember when I did get to the highest level, I remember missing some England games in, in the early part of my career because I was doing law exams. I decided not to go to South Africa um, and play against the South Africans. Uh, instead, I was doing my law exam. So nowadays, would you ever, you know, like decide not to play for your country, just concentrate on your academics? So it's very different. Obviously, now you you delay your exams and you'd go and play for your country. But I, I decided differently. So it was a very different mentality then. Yeah, so your mentality, we love that, the mentality. So what would you say gave you that foundation, that support? Was it family? Was it friends? To, you know, to handle that. And you know the culture of rugby because you know you've got to have that bonding. So if you're going away yeah. and going to education, maybe someone in the setup, you know, think you're a bit different. So you're an outcast. So what was it like? How did you handle that? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that um, in rugby terms, uh, I suppose I had a leg up because I went to a private school um, and I think, you know, 30, well, 40 years ago, um, you know, rug, rugby, the rugby elite came from um, the, the, the middle to upper class, Oxford, Cambridge type person, you know, uh, underprivileged, didn't probably play rugby union. Uh, and so I, I suppose I had what you could call um, a white middle upper class uh, leg up in the fact that, you know, not, not as many people play it as they do now. And I went to a good school and I I, I captained and I played for the county and it was all jolly good, if you know what I mean. And then when I went to university again, it was a case of, um, you know, I was already in the system and it was, it, all I would say is I was sort of, I was very lucky. I, obviously I had the talent, but I also had the leg up from the education, from the background. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, nowadays that's much less important than, than, than it probably was. You know, the likes of Will Carling, come from, you know, Seb, Seb Bus, Sandhurst, you know, uh, Rob Andrew, the fly half, you know, Cambridge University, um, you, you know, uh, private school, educated. So it's very, I think it's very different to it what it is now. So what, what is it like to change then? So what about someone who hasn't come from, you know, a leg up, so to speak? Um, how would they handle that? How would they have bought into the culture of rugby? What about the yeah. change? So I want you to give me the insight of the change, because I remember the change where rugby players started to look fit. I thought it was a new Nike T-shirts back in the So what was the difference, yeah. the culture of the leg up and the change of conditioning? Well, it was, it was, it was, I'm going to call it seismic because the game went professional in 1995 after the World Cup. So South Africa won the World Cup. 
There was the talk of having a breakaway with the Packer League um, in Australia. At Sky were going to buy into rugby, and effectively, we did, we all signed contracts with the, our rugby unions, and then and then the game went professional. But it took probably I'm going to say at least three years. So by 1998, we all understood that we had to get a lot fitter. The rules of the game were changing, um, and so you know you had to be fitter, you had to be stronger to play the game. But where did you bring this in, Kieran? So you had to be fit and stronger. What, what yeah. sport did you go into fitness, strength? Is it bodybuilding? Yeah. Is it athletics, yeah. coaches? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so rugby players in the amateur days, you know, rarely went to the gym. There wasn't that science about being, you know, getting big and getting strong. And so uh, effectively uh, our rugby teams, you see, you've got to imagine in 95, 96, half our rugby team were, uh, full-time professionals and the other half were part-time professionals and so we trained together twice a week and then the rest of the week we'd go to the gym and just mess around we weren't really taking it seriously until about 98 where we start getting proper testing so the testing came in and the, so we were tested on our body fat ratios then on our power on our squats on our uh, clean and jerks and so basically in the gym and then we were tested out in the park for our aerobic and anaerobic uh, capacity so what happened was it went from nothing to quite a lot within a couple of years and i, I guess our testing was probably similar to your sort of testing in the athletic athletics arena, where it was what can you bench press, what can you squat, how you know how high you can jump, what's your body fat percentage. So we yeah. stole we stole all of that from you in about ninety six, ninety seven. But the I'm going to say the culture was still the same typical rugby player amateur culture, which was go out on a Wednesday night, have a drink you know, party, have a curry, uh, you know, and then on a Saturday night, play a game and then do it all over again. And it was about the comradeship. It was about having, yeah. having a good laugh. It was about, it was about, it literally was about partying. It was like no. a young man. Game. It was amazing. Let, me give you, let me give you an insight, Kieran. It was like that in athletics as well. You worked hard really? and you play hard. Yeah. And after every event, you had to go to a banquet where to get your yeah. awards or so forth. Yeah. Be honest, people did didn't do the right things. But obviously when a lot of sponsors more came into the sport, you couldn't really, you know, yeah, well, I don't need to go into it. But therefore yeah. the culture was wrong. It was a mindset. And yeah. there was that, I think, gladi gladiator approach. It was yeah. like, you got injured, I oh, just have a quarter zone. It wasn't about getting a physio or nursing you back and choosing. That yeah. was just the culture. So, you know, the whole yeah. sport medicine changed. So yeah. this is why I would say the mindset, like when you said you stole the training from athletics, because, you know, that's the, the benchmark for, you know, yeah. I would say sports. Because Elite. I found that in sports, I did that by being around the right mindset of people and learn from people who's been there and done that, like the likes of Daley Thompson, you know, Colin Jackson, you know, Ro Roger Black, all these guys. So you learn from people who's been there and done that and got a proven, you know, understanding of performance, executing under pressure. So yeah. how did you support your team? Because the hardest thing, I would say, once you're talented and you've done your training, you're ready, is navigating yourself to the performance. Because you've got all these yeah. egos and these different personalities, you know, yeah. going into the, uh, the biggest battle, you know, because obviously you represent your country. And, you know, how, how did you handle that? Or did the team all get on? Did you gel? Yeah, well, you see, I mean, look, I, I played for 15 years at the highest level, 10 years for England and 15 years, uh, five, uh, 10 as a professional and five as an amateur. And I was involved in many teams with England or with clubs. And it is a, it's a, it's a great environment. It, you know, I, I would say, you know, the one thing that maybe, um, you know, which is different to your sort of career is that we do have this incredible, you know, our performance does rely on the next person. You do your high jump, it relies on you pretty much on your own. Whereas in sport, in rugby, it's a 15-man game or even with the bench coming on as well. But it's also your coaches, your physios. And first thing, the first battle is to get your best team on the pitch. And that's always like trying to get people play on injuries, strap yourselves up. It is a gladiatorial sport. But the the sort of um, the comradeship and the success really relied on the I'm going to say the really small little uh, semantics relationships. Micro, 
yeah, players. of all the players. And you'll have you'll have really great, great players who are really bad role models. You'll have yes. really average players who are great role models. You'll have this, you will have guys who really need a pat on the back every time they play, whether they're good or not, to give them confidence. You need other players who get lazy, uh, where you've got to give them a kick up the backside. And it really is, it's very different to most of the sports, you know, even yeah. football. Is, you really do need, really do need to for it all to gel. Now, Saracens Definitely. have shown what you can do when you can gel it really, really well with, you know, leaders and uh, young guys and stuff like that. But getting that right in a sporting environment, certainly rugby, is really, really hard to do. So we at Saracens, we bought in some of the best players in the world. We were copying the, um, you know, the, what do they call it? Real Madrid, the Galacticus sort of um, yeah. players. So we, we bought yes. in Francois Pinar, Philippe Seller, Tim Hora, the best, voted the best players in the world. And it didn't work. It didn't, no, it actually no. didn't work. So you can get the best players. It doesn't yes. mean to say it'll you, work. You play the best. It's all about gelling. But this is yeah. the kind of funny thing, what looking back at what, you know, on my sporting career and even what you said, um, there's a lot of people who've won the medals and if you saw them leading into the competition, they were a wreck and it was never them. It was a coach or it might be your teammate. So when yeah. I went into major championships, there's various athletes I wouldn't hang around because yeah. they didn't have the right mentality. And the funny yeah. thing, when you look back and you said it's gelling the team, let's be honest, you have to take responsibility because if you're not playing to the best of your ability, what you need to play, they're not going to take off the whole team for Kieran Racken. He has no. to play at his level. So yeah. even if it's a 2%, we need two, only 2% because that completes yeah. the team. So everybody... The margin, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The thing in rugby, yeah. the margins, you've got 15 guys and you can have one or two guys who are a bit below, but then you need the other couple of other guys yeah. to do be a little bit like that. And it sometimes... And the problem is in rugby... It very much depends on you need the key personnel who have a much more influence in the game. The thing is, you know, and I'd be interested to get your take on the psychology of, of, of the pressure of sport, which is a different sort of conversation, but it's a much more important conversation than gelling of a team. But, but in rugby, you know, you'll have players. So in my position, I was like the quarterback along with the fly half who basically would direct things that happened. And what I found hard is that if, the, if let's say, the, the, the main decision makers, the hooker, the number nine, which was me and the number 10, if they played well, then it, it, it gave a massive platform for everyone else to play well. If That's they right. play badly, then yeah, it, the it really really undermine the rest of the team. That's and so, right. unfortunately, in a game of rugby, you did have a scenario where some players were much more important to the outcome than other players. You could have a prop who can hold up the scrum and not touch the ball for the whole game, OK, um, which has the influence of just making sure you win the ball. But then you've got a number nine or number 10 who, who touches the ball 160 times or 150 times. And you want those to be like good effects on the game. But it, from, from my point of view, I always struggled with um, the pressure I put on myself to perform at a high level. Obviously, I had the pressure. Uh, let's break with that England. down. Let's yeah. break that down. What kind of pressure did you, how do you put that pressure on yourself, would you say? In what way? Well, the first thing is the outside pressure on, on okay. let's say, the game itself, which is a normal thing. Like you might have a World Championships, we would have like a World Cup, or yes. we'll have a Six Nations Championships for you. It might be a Diamond League, you know, winning the Diamond League or whatever. Yes. So, but, but you see what happens is within every player, and this is why I do have a real sympathy for footballers, um, and I've really enjoyed watching. I don't know whether you saw it all or nothing with um, with Tottenham and Mourinho. Have you seen it? If you want, get a chance no, to watch it. That that's very much. It reminded me very much of of that um, pressure cauldron of being in a in a in a team, right? And trying to gel as a team, trying to win. But the psychology of a sportsman is always like people think. You know, a coach says to the player, "Oh, you need to do this. You need to do that." But I think the most players at the highest level have this internal um, sort of uh, rating all the time about how they're doing, yeah? yeah? And that internal rating generally is a very negative one, you know? So that internal rating is, I've got to do better, I must train harder, I must jump higher, I must run faster, I must be fit, I must do this. And this, because you have a goal, which is to be the best 
within a team with England and win a World Cup or whatever, all the time you've got this pressure environment where you're rating yourself, how am I doing? I could do more. I need to do more. And that pressure, never mind opening the paper and reading it, saying stuff like, uh, oh, Matt Dawson is going to take Kieran Bracken's place. Kieran Bracken didn't play well in the last game. Da, da, da. You know, you, you read that, which is fine, but you know yourself, you're under pressure. You know, there's no more bigger critic than you yourself. And I think the... The, the people who play at the top, you know, who get to the top internationally like you did, is, you know, that that constant, constant internal ranking and rating of how you're doing is the thing that drives people to struggle with mental health. But 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 also also, you know, perversely makes them who they are. Definitely. You know, you, you talk about Johnny Wilkinson. He's like a. You know, with his kicking, he would practice for two hours after training, after, after two hours training. And and basically, he was always striving to be the best he could. But he was a he was a troubled soul. He's already talked about his uh, mental health. He was a troubled soul. But it, it was all driven by perfection. And yeah. I would get mad at the match in some of the games. And I'd come off and I'd straight away go, oh, I missed a tackle. I did a bad pass. I did one bad kick. I did this. I must do that. And that's that's the sort of burden that we, that we yeah. sort of, Oh, that's the cross that we bear as as as, as high end athletes. And I think people, when they look on TV and they see footballers and they say, "Ah, oh, you're having a great time. They're getting paid loads, and they hardly train, and life's great." But those players, they go through the highest internal torment. Um, it's a roller coaster external. of emotions, isn't it? A yeah, of emotions. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, what, what was it like for you then? So the, for the, the me, um, what I did, I was prepared. I was always pushing myself, and I always had my preparation. So six weeks um, leading up to any majors, I would visualize. So I did all my training, and I visualized, and I would look at things that kind of motivate me, like gladiators, rugby players, SAS yeah. mindset. I'm, yeah. I'm not going. I'm going down fighting. I went down. Yeah. So if you saw me, I was a very passionate person. So even when yeah. I went into like. Major champions, sometimes my, my warm up was diabolical. I mean, I couldn't even right. but I'm still going to come in at 215 or 230. Once I make yeah. my mind, I stick to it. And I think when yeah. I get into that motion and the energy, my passion and the drive to fail and everything, I'm very good for taking that energy. And I get to yeah. that point where I'm going to explode, but I kind of calm down and it goes inside and it starts to boil. It's boiling, and then I hold that energy, and I take it around, and I'm wanting to lay it out, lay it out, and I don't, and I just hit, put my foot down, bam, and explode, and relax, yeah. and flick over the bar. So that's how I can only expose that. So I think I, I like to ride energy. I'm a passion person, and this is now yeah. when I coach people, I bring that passion. If you not, if I can't look at you and look into your eyes, and I can't see that stillness. And you've got yeah. that gladiator approach. No, so I'm not a person where I know it. That I'm going to drive it out of you. I'll build you up. And if I know you, you take it on board, or I build you and kick you up the ass to get it out of you. I mean, you what, what, so what would you like? Not physically, what? mind you, I don't want no one to think that I'm yeah, going around yeah. my athletes. What, you know? So what were you like? What were you like then uh, with with uh, like the disappointment? So let's say you you know you go into a championship and uh, you set yourself a target which is which is achievable, and you go nowhere near it. Um, how did you react emotionally and psych? You know, do, do you think? Yeah. yeah. Emotionally really bad, I would think. I took it bad. I was very hard on myself. I used to punish myself and I wouldn't go out or treat myself in certain areas. But one thing yeah. I've learned later on in life, why I think I had a long career, I'd give a time minute to moan. So I'd moan and go over it for maybe, let's say, 10 minutes. Yeah. And after that, yeah. it's done and dusted. It can't affect yeah. it. Even if someone yeah. pulls it up and goes, yeah, so it, it wasn't to be. Because, I mean, I've been fourth in so many championships, jumping the same height as a silver medal, jumping 235, 236, heights that have won the Olympics and never ever got a medal. I think I'm the only high jumper in the world that's jumped 236 and not achieved a medal. But wow. I knew the way I went out and compete with my heart on my sleeve, I'm very proud of myself. I'm not a bitter athlete where I said, if I went back, I would change, no. Because I didn't even want to do athletics. So it helped me when I look back on what I've achieved we got both the same thing in, um, in common, being captain of our country, and that's a great honour. So I look back and, and think, that's my legacy, what I left, and hopefully now I'm using my experience to help elevate people to do and achieve. I mean, yeah. I'm coaching, I coached a youngster, um, his, uh, his name is Harry uh, Asherall, and he actually 
at 16, you know, got a call up for England in, when they had an England cap in, in Bristol under 18s. So yeah. he, he, he plays a centre. Um, I also um, work with a, a young guy called um, Alex Wardell, and he's at Loughborough oh, yeah. University, and yeah. he plays Saracen. You know, he's yeah. 17. So he plays front five and four in between. Yeah. So yeah. what would you give them any insight that can help them on their career, you know, or to deal with the hard times and the good times, keeping it yeah. Well, I think I think um, rugby is one of those sports which is um, which is kind of like there's so many different aspects to it now. So you've got the skill level that's required in your position, you've got the skill level required in the game of rugby generally, but then you've got the um, the fitness element which is which is hugely important, and then you've got um, and then you've got the psychology and the mentality. So you've got those three things. So you've got skill level. You've got the, uh, let's call it the athlete himself, and then you've got psychology. And they all work together massively. So you can't have a player who, you can't have a player who has really high skill level, who isn't very fit, got great mentality, because what will happen is after 10 minutes, they'll be out of the game. You know, you can't have a player which is, does, has a low skill, uh, great mentality, really fit, and like five times in the game, they drop the ball. You can't have a player who has a very uh, like like self-esteem and very low in confidence, right? Who's got really good skills and a really good athlete, but then they shy away in the game and they hide. So what you need is you need, um, you need literally the, those three things to work in tandem and everyone has a weakness in one of them, you know? So for example, my eldest boy, um, he's, <clears throat> so he's got great mentality, core skills are really good. But um, physic like physically, he's slightly behind in his year. He was premature, so he's slightly behind in that. So he's, he's working really hard to catch up on his strength and his speed and those sort of things, you know. So he's working really hard on it. And I think it's important that, um, you know, that young players, like, recognise of those three things. So where am I, you know, where am I weakest? And that's where you focus some of your strengths so, so, but also recognizing the other two you have to keep going so if you have a player and I think one of the hardest ones I think when it comes to phys, you know being an athlete itself um, I think that's probably the easy part do you know what I mean uh, I, there's a lovely quote from Paul O'Connell the the Lions second row from Ireland <clears throat> and it's it's absolutely it's a brilliant quote and I I say it to my young young players and and it's great for coaches when you can say it to people you say be world class in things that require no talent right so it's the one of the most amazing quotes I've ever heard right and it's so 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 important so for example <clears throat> Working hard in training to get yourself fitter to become an athlete uh, doesn't require talent. Yes, you need the DNA to be able to do it, but it requires this ethic, this world-class ethic to train really hard to be the best athlete you can, right? Now, you had it, I had it, lots of people don't have it. They don't have that world-class attitude to do things that require no talent, right? Definitely. When it comes to psychology, that's the hardest part with players and sportsmen. That's the hardest part to, to get right. You know that the people you coach, that some players, some, some athletes, you can say, you're not working hard enough. You're not doing this. You need to do that. And then they'll react really well. Yeah. But then you'll have people you say that to, and then they'll hide and they'll be scared and they'll lose confidence. So the thing is, is trying to understand of those three different things you know, it is because because you know what? There's loads of people out there. There's loads of people out there who have who have talent. All right, yeah, but to make them successful, they have to have a work ethic. They have to have a, a drive to become the best they can. Right, and then finally, they have to have the mentality to be able to work on the things that they're not good at and become the complete athlete and win like you did. Definitely right. Yeah, because that's what I always say: work ethic, mindset, technique. Yeah, because sometimes if your technique ain't working, your mindset gonna pull you through. But I'm, I'm gonna have to be honest here because I've got Jesus and God sitting on my tongue. So I know yeah. that you, you know, be straightforward. I know that obviously in the world today with racism and so forth, I'm just yeah. going in. I, I don't want you to go too deep. Just like color, because I know once you're at a certain level, it's not about color. Because talent ain't color. Talent is talent. So how do you feel like you know? Obviously, I uh, had black players in the team. Can you imagine what they're going through? What was it like in your eyes, would you say? 
Well, um, that's a really interesting question, and I've, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've never really, I've never really thought about it because you know the Black Lives Matter and everything. You know, you see what's happening, and you kind of, um, you kind of, you look at it very. Um, you don't look at it from your own perspective, in a sense, and and it's no one's ever asked me. You know, what do I think it must have been like for Victor Abugu, Adedeo Adebayo, uh, Steve Jomo? Uh, Jerry Guscott, what was it like for them being in a very white dominated uh, rugby environment? And the first thing what I would say is typical rugby attitude would be take the piss out of, out of the, the you know, we're going to call it the token black person in the team. All right. Because the only way to sort of, you know, the sort of things that were said those days you know, you could never say these days, you know, yeah. so there was, I think, and I, you know, it was, it was much more in a jovial way. I have no idea of how um, that felt for the black players within the team. I've no idea. And at the time, you know, being honest, we never really thought about it because we weren't really, um, aware i i suppose of what their struggle might be so adadeo adabeo you know all the jokes would be the typical jokes about you know about black people without being right you know being really well hung or whatever we'd take the piss out of them being really well hung you know you know is that is that racist or is that jovial or, or never never really recognized well what does that how does that make them feel yeah. and then I, if it, coming from Nigeria, there'll be all sorts of jokes about Nigeria, you know, you know, lots of wives and stereotypical jovial stuff where looking back at the time, we thought it meant nothing. But I'll be honest with you, I have no idea how it made them feel. Um, no idea. Now, I, I, my guess is some of them would have been offended and some of them wouldn't have been offended. How do you think they would have taken it? Because you, you're in that environment. Yeah, that environment for, for me... Yes, I was aware of it, but I had to push it on one side because nothing could affect me when I was going out there, you know, to try and achieve my ultimate goal. If it did affect me, I shouldn't be out there because it's about pressure. And you know what yeah. athletes would do. If athletes would take drugs to achieve, they would say anything. Yeah. They would say racist, you know. But there were more athletes. There were more athletes of colour. So you had you had role models, didn't you, already in athletics. So, and that's why I... I, We were the pioneers, though, Kim. We were the first. Don't forget, we broke it through when it changed from that, you know, rowing and that rugby and that mindset, that culture, coming from a Depay background and going and, you know, achieving at a high level. So um, it's not now you'd walk off, but I'd never think dream of walking off. No. No. I have to handle it, suck it up and take it to the next level. And that's when you get to a level as an athlete to block things out. And yeah. you've got to know, even if it was the person I love dearly, my parents, even if yeah. someone commented about them at that time, I would not respond. I wouldn't budge. Mm. Because I know you're trying to get an action. That action, you are not going to get it from me. I'm staying yeah. cool, calm and collective. and take care of business. Now, after, yeah. or if it's like maybe four days before, that's a different story. <laughs> so yeah. and that's how you kind of you handle with things, but what I realized, what I endured as an athlete and how I am now to help people, which the pioneers, I see yourself as a pioneers, that they need to tap in more to people like us to help. It is wrong. And some people have got to watch their P's and Q's in so to speak, because things that they could have said naturally years ago that they can't say now, because now no. they will lose their job. So I think it's got to be a culture and we have to look into this and we have to take time to help to make change, but well, I think, mm-hmm. I think there's a big change. There is a big change in rugby now. Uh, there's there's a lot more players of colour coming into the game of rugby. Uh, when they watched it on TV, there was very very few black players, um, and nowadays there's a there's a, a lot more. Uh, players because they see role models playing for England. You know, there's quite a few of colour. Courtney Laws, lots of players. Anthony Watson, there's loads of players now. So there's role models. And so people don't, you know, they might see you and other guys in athletics and they'll say, well, no, I can play rugby. I don't, I don't have to go to the private school anymore. No, I can be, I can be a, a professional rugby player. So there are quite a lot coming through, and they're great for the game because they're powerful, they're strong, you know. And um, but I think the old, the old amateur environment, you know, we, we, you know players would be put in prison for the things we said, you know, oh, yeah. and did as well. But it's, I think, you know, 
things have changed and I think it's great. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. The good thing is there's not many coaches, black coaches, which is interesting. No. You know, I mean, a lot of players. Is that temperament that you have to have? You know, that temperament? I don't, no, I don't think. I, I, I think, well, no. I As think, a coach, I think, you see the difference is the transition of being an athlete and being a coach. Because there's things that happen naturally to you and what you could do, someone else can't do it. Because your standards or your worst standards could be very high to someone else. Because remember, you're a high role model. Well, think about it. Around the world, there are no role models. There are no, uh, there's very few, and, and the same in football, but there are very few black coaches. You know, there's plenty of black players who played the game to an international standard, but they don't go into coaching because I don't think they feel that they'll get a fair crack at the whip. No, definitely. The politics, I, I mean, I feel like that because I don't feel my sport taps into me, but it doesn't affect me from going out there and helping people in rugby, basketball, yeah. football, because I'm doing very well, you know, coaching people. Yeah. That's all I want to do. I've learned from the arena of success. So why can't yeah. I pass that back? Like you're saying, because you're a great coach and you might know more than me, does it mean you can get more out of an athlete than me? No, yeah. because at the end of the day for us, it's micro improvement and it's all about results. So I want to give you a question, final question. If I yeah. gave you a magic wand and you had one wish, what would be your wish be? Wow, oh, goodness me, one wish, one wish. One wish, come on, straight no, like that. one wish. I've got one minute to come out with it. Um, um, Oh, I wish for my kids to enjoy the sport like I did and have a taste of what it is to be an elite athlete. How's that? Brilliant. Kieran Pracken, 2007 Dancing on Ice champion. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, let me go back. 2003 member of the World Cup winning yeah. team rugby. Thank you for the um, great insight to your life. And Cheers. Looking forward to be seeing you soon. Yeah, today, so. Today's show is sponsored by Rhythm Kitchen. Caribbean food, fresh off the grill.